everyone. Welcome to Storytime at Palisades Park Public Library. My name is Rachel, and every week we're going to be reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum together. Let's enjoy! Chapter 13, The Rescue. The Cowardly Lion was much pleased to hear that the Wicked Witch had been melted by a bucket of water, and Dorothy at once set, unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free. They went in together to the castle, where Dorothy's first act was to call all the Winkies together and tell them they were no longer slaves. There was great rejoicing among the Yellow Winkies, for they had been made to work hard during many years for the Wicked Witch, who had always treated them with great cruelty. They kept this day as a holiday, then and ever after, and spent the time in feasting and dancing. If our friends the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were only with us, said the lion, I should be quite happy. Don't you suppose we could rescue them? asked the girl anxiously. We can try, answered the lion. So they called the yellow Winkies and asked them if they could rescue their friends. And the Winkies said they would be delighted to do all in their power for Dorothy who had set them free from bondage. So she chose a number of the Winkies, who looked as if they knew the most, and they all started away. They traveled that day and part of the next until they came upon the rocky plain where the tin woodman lay, all battered and bent. His ax was near him, but the blade was rusted and the handle broken off short. The Winkies lifted him up tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the yellow castle again, and Dorothy, shedding a few tears by the way the sad plight of her old friend and the lion looked sober and sorry when they reached the castle dorothy said to the winkies are any of your people tinsmiths oh yes some of us are very good tinsmiths they told her then bring them to me she said and when the tinsmiths came bringing with them all their tools in the baskets she inquired can you straighten out the dents in the tin woodman and bend him back into shape again and solder him together where he is broken? The tinsmiths looked over the woodman carefully and answered that they thought they could mend him so that he would be as good as new. So they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights, hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding the legs and body and the head of the tin woodman until at last he was straightened out to his old form. His joints were worked on as well as ever. To be sure, there were several patches on him, but the tin smiths did a good job, and as the woodman was not a vain man, he did not mind the patches at all. <clears throat> when at last he walked into Dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him, he was so pleased that he wept tears of joy, and Dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron so that his joints would not be rusted. At the same time, her own tears fell thick and fast with the joy of meeting her old friend again, and these tears did not need to be wiped away. As for the lion, he wiped his eyes so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet. He was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold on until the sun dried it. If only we had the scarecrow with us again, said the tin woodman, when Dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened. I should be quite happy. We must try to find him, said the girl. So she called the Winkies to help her, and they walked all that day and part of the next until they came to the tall tree in the branches of which the winged monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes. It was a very tall tree, and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it. But the woodman said at once, I'll chop it down and we can get the scarecrow's clothes. Now, while the tinsmiths had been at work mending the woodman himself, another of the Winkies, who was a goldsmith, had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle. Others polished the blade until all the rust was removed and it glistened like burnished silver. As soon as he had spoken, the tin woodman began to chop, and in a short time, the tree fell over with a crash whereupon the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground. Dorothy picked them up and had the Winkies carry them back to the castle, where they were stuffed with a nice clean straw, and behold, here was the scarecrow. As good as ever, thanking them over and over again for saving him. 
Now that they were reunited, Dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the Yellow Castle, where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable. But one day, the girl thought of Aunt Em and said, We must go back to Oz and claim his promise. Yes, said the woodman. At last I shall get my heart. And I shall get my brains, added the scarecrow joyfully. And I shall get my courage, said the lion thoughtfully. And I shall get back to Kansas, cried Dorothy, clapping her hands. Oh, let us start for the Emerald City tomorrow. This they decided to do. The next day, they called the Winkies together and bade them goodbye. The Winkies were sorry to have them go, and they had grown so fond of the Tin Woodman, they begged him to stay and rule over them in the yellow land of the West. Finding they were determined to go, the Winkies gave Toto and the Lion each a collar, and to Dorothy they presented a beautiful bracelet set with diamonds. To the Scarecrow they gave a gold-headed walking stick to keep him from stumbling. And to the Tin Woodman they offered a silver oiled can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels. Every one of the travelers made the Winkies a pretty speech in return and all shook hands with them until their arms ached. Dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey, and there she saw the golden cap. She tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly. But she did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap. She saw that it was pretty, so she made up her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket. Then, being prepared for the journey, they all started for the Emerald City, and the Winkies gave them three cheers, yay, and many good wishes to carry them. Chapter 14, The Winged Monkeys. You will remember there was no road, not even a pathway, between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. When the four travelers went in search of the witch, she had seen them coming, so she sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her. It was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups and yellow daisies than it was to be carried. They knew, of course, they must go straight east toward the rising sun, and they started off the right way. But at noon, when the sun was over their heads, they did not know which way was east and which way was west, and that was the reason they were lost in the great fields. They kept on walking, however, and at night the moon came out and shone brightly. So they lay down among the sweet-smelling yellow flowers and slept soundly until morning, all but the scarecrow and the tin woodman. The next morning the sun was behind a cloud, but they started on as if they were quite sure which way they were going. If we walk far enough, said Dorothy, I'm sure we will sometime come to the place. But day by day passed until they say nothing before them but scarlet fields. The scarecrow began to grumble a bit. We have surely lost our way, he said. And unless we find it in time to reach Emerald City, I shall never get my brains. Nor my heart, declared the tin woodman. It seems to me I can scarcely wait until I get to Oz. You must admit this is a very long journey. You see, said the cowardly lion with a whimper, I am the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all. Then Dorothy lost heart. She sat down on the grass and looked at her companions, and they sat down and looked at her. And Toto found for the first time in his life he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head. So he put out his tongue, panted, and looked at Dorothy as if to ask what they should do next. Suppose we call the field mice, she suggested. They could probably tell us the way to Emerald City. To be sure they could, cried the scarecrow. Why didn't we think of that before? Dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck since the queen of the mice had given it to her. In a few minutes, they heard the pattering of tiny feet, and many of the small gray mice came running up to her. Among them was the queen herself, who asked in her squeaky little voice, What can I do for my friends? We have lost our way, said Dorothy. Can you tell us where the Emerald City is? Certainly, answered the queen, but it is a great way off, for you have had it your backs this whole time. Then she noticed Gorthy's golden cap and said, Why don't you use the charm of the cap to call the winged monkeys to you? They will carry you to the city of Oz in less than an hour. I didn't know there was a charm, said Dorothy in surprise. What is it? It is written inside the golden cap replied the queen of the mice. But if you are going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, 
but they are full of mischief and think it is great fun to plague us. Won't they hurt me? asked the girl anxiously. Oh, no, they must obey the wearer of the cap. Goodbye. And she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining. These, she thought, must be the charm. She read the directions carefully and put the cap upon her head. Uh, epe, pepe, kake, she said, standing on her left foot. What did you say? asked the scarecrow, who did not know what she was doing. Hilo, hello, holo, Dorothy went on, standing this time on her right foot. Hello, replied the tin woodman calmly. Zizzy, zuzzy, zick, said Dorothy, who was now standing on both feet. This ended the saying of the charm, and they heard a great chattering and flapping of wings as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them. The king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? Uh, we wish to go to the Emerald City, said the child. We have lost our way. We will carry you, replied the king. And no sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion. And one little monkey seized Toto and flew after them, although the dog tried hard to bite him. The scarecrow and the woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before. But they saw that no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and the woods far below them. Dorothy found herself riding easily between two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They made a chair of their hands and were careful not to hurt her. Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap? she asked. That is a long story, answered the king with a winged laugh. But we have long journey to pass before us. We'll pass behind by telling you if you wish. Oh, I should be glad to hear it, she replied. Once, began the leader, we were a free people living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit, doing just as we pleased without calling anybody master. But some of us were rather too full of mischief at that times, flying down to pull the tails of animals that had no wings, chasing birds, and throwing nuts at people who walked in the forest. But we were careless and happy and full of fun, enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away at the north, a beautiful princess, who was also a powerful sorceress. All of her magic was used to help the people, and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Galette, and she lived in a handsome palace built from the great blocks of ruby. Everyone loved her, but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to mate with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Galette made up her mind that when, she grew to be a, when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to her ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood, Kilala, as he was called, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land, while his manly beauty was so great that Galette loved him dearly and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather at the time was the king of the winged monkeys, which lived in the forest near Galette's palace, and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Kalala walking beside the river. He was dressed in a rich costume of pink silk and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought it would be, thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Kalala, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river and dropped him into the water. Swim out, my fine fellow, cried my grandfather and see if the water has spotted your clothes. Kilala was much too wise not to swim, and when he was in the least spoiled by his good fortune, he laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam to shore. But when Galette came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. The princess was angry, and she knew, of course, who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, 
and she said at first their wings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated poor Kilala, and dropped in the river. And my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied, and Kilala said a kind word for them also, so that Galette finally spared them on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made a wedding present to Kalala, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to the condition, and that is how it happens that we are three times the slaves to the owner of the golden cap, whosoever he may be. And what became of them? asked Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in this story. Kilala, being the first owner of the golden cap, replied the monkey, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could not bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married and ordered us always to keep where she would never again set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the wicked witch of the West, who made us enslave the Winkies and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to play your wishes upon us. As the Monkey King finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green, shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creatures set the travelers down carefully before the gate of the city, and the king bowed low to Dorothy and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. That was a good ride, said the little girl. Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles, replied the lion. How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap. <laughs>